All right. Trying again. All right. Try number two. Okay. We think. I see what happened is the mouse ends up right over the live. Anyway. All right. Hold on one second. I think that's right. And I think, is it is it in the hay shortage event or? No, it's on the main page. Okay. Hold on one second. Let me tell the world where we are. Um, thanks to technology issues. All right. Do you want to hear? Um, sorry, I'm just trying to let everyone know where we are. Uh, that we have got a few people here. Uh, I don't know about any of you guys out there in Facebook land who've tried to buy hay lately. Um, and obviously we're, we're sort of concentrating on Florida and the local area, but it's been, it's been a challenge. That's for sure. There's been, uh, you know, typically a lot of the hay that's fed in this area is coastal, which is locally grown. Um, and we're, we're rapidly running out of it. And there's a few reasons for that. Uh, Dr. Vineyard is here from Purina to help us talk about some of the reasons why and then how we can manage our hay resources best. But my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Vineyard, is that this year, first of all, it was a rough year to grow hay in Florida, not to mention a lot of other places in the country. We had fires, droughts, floods, you name it. Mother Nature was not on our side to grow hay. And then some of the hay from the Florida area ended up in the West trying to manage their short supplies of hay. Mm -hmm. So it seems like we've got a bit of a perfect storm going on in terms of trying to manage hay supplies. So from a nutritionist standpoint, and I'm, I'm definitely, the, one of the reasons we have Dr. Vineyard on here is her advice is going to help you not see me on an emergency on Saturday night <laughs> at 3 a.m. <laughs> so from a nutritionist standpoint, what do we do? How do we manage this? <laughs> yeah. Well, right. I mean, the, the, that's a really good point. Like, let's try to avoid, you know, the problems associated with lack of good quality hay intake, which, you know, can be colic. It can be, that's what everybody thinks about it in the middle of the night on a Friday, but it can also just be like digestive issues and they can, and, and gastric ulcers. And, you know, there's a lot of other problems associated with lack of fiber intake for a horse. Um, so I guess, I mean, yes, to answer your question to the hay shortage problem is widespread. It's, I'm hearing about it from all parts of the country. So these conversations are happening a lot everywhere, unfortunately. And I don't think this is going to be the last time we see this. So I think, you know, if you own horses, and are responsible for procuring their hay. Um, there's a couple things, there's a lot of things you can do to sort of make sure your hay supply lasts. Um, I guess the first thing we can talk about is maybe preserving the hay that you have. You know, ideally when you, even if you just have two horses on your property, and if you have like either an extra stall or somewhere that's covered, you can buy, you know, larger quantities of hay at a time as opposed to a bale or two. And that's always the best recommendation. Um, I like to buy my whole season's worth of hay if I can, but that's really dependent on if you have a place to keep it. Um, you know, you really need to store hay out, you know, covered, right? So if you don't have a covered place to store hay, it'd be better to buy it in small quantities from somewhere instead of, you know, storing it outside in the weather. Um, okay, so that being said, preserving the hay you have, if you have square bales, you you can use feeders for square bales. A, a lot of people think about hay feeders for round bales, but you can use them for square bales too, especially if you're throwing hay out on a pasture for horses. I mean, who doesn't see that extra layer of hay that horses ended up stomping and peeing on and not eating? that can be up to, you know, 15% waste, okay, from a square bale when you feed it just off the ground. Same thing in the stall. If you feed it off the ground in a stall, they're going to waste up to 15% as opposed to if you either use like a hay net or some type of installed hay feeder um, on the wall. So that can reduce hay waste and save you some money. And then, you know, talking about the uh, round bales, you know, if people are feeding those, 
just just using a round bale feeder can say like over 50% of round bale hay is wasted if you don't use a feeder. They've done studies on this. The um, University of Minnesota actually does a lot of great research in this area about hay wastage. And if you're really nerdy like me and you want to go read like the best hay uh, ring available, you go look at some of their studies. But just a plain old hay ring, nothing fancy. Um, I actually jotted it down. Um, that's only about 19% hay waste versus 57% hay waste with no ring. Okay. Ooh, so big 57? Difference. Over half. Yeah. With no <laughs> ring. And I mean, you see it like that huge mound of gross hay that like adds up and eventually you just have to get rid of it because it's starting to grow flies and gunk and you know, it's not pretty. And um, so hay rings can be helpful. And there's other types of hay feeders too. I mean, I've seen this thing and I think it came from someone in Florida called the hay hut and it looks like a little child's play pen or playhouse and it's plastic, but it protects the hay from, from rain. So that's even better. Um, and that's even less waste. I think that's like five or 6% waste with something like that. So um, probably the cheapest option I've ever seen is something called the cinch net. So it, and it's by these, um, this company called Hey Chicks, and I'm not associated with them at all, but I just like their products. It's this huge, big hay net that can cover a hay roll. So, and those are pretty cost effective and it slows the horse's intake rate and it reduces waste. So those are good options too. That's what I use at my house. And I've oh, really? been amazed. Yeah. At how much it dramatically reduces the waste. And uh, I don't know how the nutritionist feels about this, but, you know, they do like to go in there and, and eat more than they need, you know, and, and times like this, it's, it's tough. I want to keep them at what they need as opposed to what they want. I mean, I want to stay that way on ice cream too, but it doesn't work well. Right. Um, and so we've actually taken them and put them in two of those nets to make it even mm. harder and slow things down. Mm, that's a good idea. And, and that's a good reminder too. It's kind of hard to, to weigh round bell, you know, to, I, to, to weigh that out. But if you're feeding square bells, you know, a lot of it's just, let's throw two to three flakes, you know, twice a day. But it, it would probably help you and save you some hay if you actually weighed your flakes and weighed your hay and think about, you know, what percentage of body weight. That's what horses have a requirement of fiber for a percent of body weight. It's going to be somewhere between one and a half to two and a half percent body weight, depending on the horse. If they're, you know, overweight and obese and we're putting them on a diet. We're going to be more on the one and a half percent body weight side. If they need to gain weight, more two and a half percent body weight. But if you're mindlessly feeding hay, you could be throwing them 3% of their body weight in hay every day. And, and most of that's getting wasted or a lot of it's getting wasted as either extra fat or just on the ground. So all of those different things using hay feeders, weighing your hay can preserve what you have. Now so you should probably start with weighing your horse too, which we have a great video on that on our YouTube, just a total aside, but knowing what your horse weighs can help you start all this. Absolutely. They, they don't weigh a thousand pounds. I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> no, some of them are close, but a lot of them are not. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, besides that, then you're, you know, you're now you're faced with a situation and you're, you're trying to buy some hay and either what they have at the feed store is really expensive or it's just doesn't meet your quality standards, maybe we should talk about some alternatives. Um, you got a, several alternatives. Um, probably the first one that comes to mind that's easy to get, hay pellets. You can get you know alfalfa pellets, Timothy pellets. Um, you can get cubes, hay cubes. Sometimes you can find alfalfa Timothy cubes that are mixed. Those are kind of nice. Um, and then you can find chopped bagged forage. Okay. So all of those can be used as a hundred percent replacement for hay. So say you want to feed maybe five or 10 pounds of long stem hay, but then you want to stretch that hay supply with something else. Just replace it pound for pound with the pellets, the cubes, the chopped bag forage, all of that is like a one pound per pound replacement. Um, and then you have other, I guess you'd say non-grass or non-forage items like beet pulp. A lot of people know about beet pulp and that's a high fiber material. Soaked beet pulp is a great fiber source. You know, probably wouldn't use that as a hundred percent hay replacement. It can be used as a partial hay replacement. Again, pound for pound is, is a good 
place to start, but just keep in mind beet pulp is higher in calories. So a pound, pound for beet pound. Pulp, Sorry, pound for pound, dry or soaked? Uh, dry. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a lot of beet pulp because once you soak that beet pulp, it, it grows big. And that's a good point. Um, I I like soaking beet pulp. Um, I think it's a good idea. Um, nutritionists, some nutritionists will tell you you can feed it dry. Um, we actually include it dry in a lot of our feed formulas, um, but at a kind of a lower inclusion rate. But when you're feeding straight beet pulp, soaking it just to me, it, it keeps your risk of choke down. So, and your horse probably will like it better. <laughs> and your veterinarian will like it better if you keep yeah. your risk of choke down. Yeah, much, much better. <laughs> um, one, uh, another, um, thing that you can use to stretch your hay supply is soy hulls. Now, a lot of people aren't familiar with that. Um, you can buy them pelleted, um, again, probably only about a partial replacement. It's not really a great full replacement. Um, but those are really good source of fiber. We use a lot of soy holes in, in a lot of our complete feeds that like equine senior, um, and Omeline 400. So those actually are good sources of fiber, just maybe only a 50% replacement. And then once you kind of move past some of these like individual ingredients, then you can talk about some commercial products. So there are commercial products out there. You can get the feed store called hay stretchers. Hay stretchers are excellent. Um, they're usually pretty cost effective, especially when you compare it maybe to alfalfa pellets even. They have a pretty similar nutritional component as hay, but they're usually balanced with, you know, vitamins and minerals. And so they aren't going to kind of throw off the rest of your, like if you're feeding hay, a little bit of concentrate, a little bit of hay stretcher. I mean, it literally does what it says. It stretches your hay and it kind of keeps everything in balance. Um, and they're usually pretty readily available. And, and then finally, you can use complete feeds as a hay stretcher. Um, and when I say complete feed, I don't mean, you know, a feed that contains protein, vitamins, and minerals to meet your horse's daily requirement. That's not what we, our vernacular in the feed industry, we call a complete feed something that is intended to replace all or a portion of the forage in the diet. So equine seniors, perfect example, horse is old, their teeth are bad, they can't eat hay, they can eat 100% of their ration as equine senior and that meets all their forage requirements because we grind it up and put it in the pellet. So you can use senior um, and there's other complete feeds out there too. Um, Only 400 is actually a really good complete feed for performance horses, if you have horses with higher energy requirements, um, there's um, any, you know, any kind of most senior feeds are complete feeds, though. So um, but just double check that on the feeding directions and you can use that as a full or partial replacement okay. for your long stemmed hay. Now, if I buy a bag of senior and I'm using that to replace as full or partial, how do I decide basically how much of it? is hay and how or how much of it is replacement and how much hay do i need to supplement to make sure i hit those numbers so on the back of the bag there will be feeding directions for two scenarios one is for feeding with hay and one is for feeding without hay so if you go by the directions without hay that's about 1.5 percent of the horse's body weight 1.2 to 1.5 for you know, so if you have a thousand pound horse that doesn't exist, <laughs> um, you know, you're going to feed 13 and a half pounds a day of equine senior. And that is a full replacement for hay. Now, obviously, you're going to want to break that up into multiple meals per day because, you know, they're going to want to chew something. You know, they have chew factor. So if you say, well, look, I only want to feed eight pounds of senior and I, I can feed five or six pounds of hay for every two pounds of hay you add to that complete feed you can subtract one pound of concentrate. And that's kind of a rough estimate. I mean, there's, and it's, it's written on the bag uh, for Equine Senior, so if you forget, you can go and read it on the bag. But um, it gives you some kind of guidelines if, if you're gonna feed with hay, how much to reduce that that's complete feed. And it's all based on calories and, and then with a the fiber requirement too. Okay. So what do we do? Uh, Sherry Lyon has a question that we commonly have in this scenario. You know, we take these, these sort of options to try to stretch our hay availability, but now we've got a horse that's in a stall, let's say, for a prolonged period of time, or they're in a sacrifice paddock, something like that, where we don't have great hay. Thank you, Gigi, for your commentary back there. Um, where we don't have, you know, great roughage sources for them. 
but they're a horse that maybe is a little bit sensitive and needs to have something in that gut all the time. You know, do we have options that will allow us to, to kind of keep something in front of them longer? Yeah. I mean, that's the biggest downside to these pelleted hay replacers is the horses will eat them quickly. And, um, you know, the consumption rate is pretty fast. So ideally d kind of having both some long stem hay and some pelleted options, a, a mixture is going to help extend that feeding time. Horses can also eat wheat straw. Um, they have to be acclimated to it. Um, some horses do better with it than others. It um, can be used in like low amounts for that chew factor kind of is what you're talking about a little bit. So like really good quality wheat straw, we typically think of that as bedding, especially if you've got mares and babies, a lot of farms will use that as bedding. They will chew on that a little bit and you have to be careful though, because if they eat too much of it, they're going to be calling you at midnight <laughs> for impaction colic. So, <laughs> um, so, so I, that's my caution about wheat straw, but sometimes you have to weigh the risk and the benefit. Okay. If this horse is really high risk for ulcers, and if he stands around for, you know, six hours at a time without any forage, maybe we should try a little bit of this to see if we can get, get something in him. Right. Um, and the, I've also seen, so if you're looking at pellets and that's all you've got, or say you've got a horse with no teeth and, you know, he can only eat the pelleted options. I've seen people use these automatic feeders that just, you know, will dispense a pound of pellets, you know, every hour or every two hours. And it's a very small amount. You, you know, I've seen people use deer feeders. <laughs> and then there are also special ones for horses that you can purchase also. They're not cheap, but it is an option. I have to say the deer feeder option I've seen a couple of clients use. And one of the things I like about it is that, you know, at least if it's in a scenario where they're not going to pick up too much sand, that's my biggest fear of it. But if it's not, then it seems like it's fantastic for um, also giving them something to do, you know, like they, for it. they go walk around and look for it. Yeah. They got to spend more time looking for it. Yeah. I mean, people are very creative. So, you know, if you could figure out how to get that to like go on a mat somehow, that would be <laughs> ideal. Cause you know, you do have to worry about sand, picking up sand. But yeah, well, these are all fantastic ideas. I know we're all struggling with it. And um, it sounds like, especially from, from conversations you're having that we're struggling with it all over the country. So I want to say thank you for all of these great ideas. Um, ah, automatic feeders when you have two horses and one will eat the other one. Mm. That, that's just tough. I think it's a matter of having to bring them into separate feeding slots to do that, unfortunately. Not a great answer there. Yeah, there's a very expensive option to that dilemma too, where you can use like radio collars that open certain doors for a horse to go into an area with an automatic feeder. Um, again, pretty cost prohibitive, but those are available. Kind of like the little cat doors that are, you know, that only open for certain cats with their collars on. They actually do make big horse size versions of those. Well, that's cool. But I think, uh, you know, it sounds like looking for options to, to slow your horse down um, in terms of eating proper amounts of hay uh, for their, their weight. And again, that was one and a half to 2% for the average horse, correct? Yeah. Or two and a half if one that needs to gain weight, but um, okay. You know, 2% is a good place to start, um, but it can be less for horses that are overweight. And, you know, one last thing, too, that I haven't mentioned yet is, is, is really, or maybe I have mentioned it, but to really stress, like, for next year, like, but, you know, this year is kind of gone, you know, hay is bad, but now the growing season is about to start. If you don't already have a relationship with a hay producer, um, make, make some relationships, find who sells hay in your area. You can look on your extension website, you know, for Florida or for whatever state you're in, figure out who's selling hay and get on their list for next year, like now, <laughs> you know, and that way you can make a calculation, you know, when do you think you'll feed hay? Like here, you know, is it, what is it? Mid October to mid April, you know, it might be different depending on your pasture, but, and then how many days is that? How much hay does your hor eat, horse eat per day? figure the calculation of how many tons you might need for the season and, and go ahead and think about reserving your hay for next year early. Yeah. We talk about having a great relationship with your veterinarian. You need to have a great relationship with your hay supplier too. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Sherry has a question about coastal hay and what is our thoughts on it? I know I have mine. What are, what are nutritionist thoughts on coastal hay? 
Well, I think you and I are feel similarly about coastal. My take is, you know, it's very readily available here. So good coastal is is good to feed for most horses. Bad coastal is bad, <laughs> you know, really bad, really bad. So if you don't know the difference between good coastal and bad coastal, that's where you, you need to try to get educated and maybe have your vet help you or another per, horse person. But, you know, the really fine coastal, you know, that's what can cause impaction colic. And so, but if it's good coastal that's been put up properly, um, most horses do quite well with it. I certainly find that adding other roughage sources like um, Sherry uh, Omer is asking about peanut hay, which I really like. Adding a little bit of peanut or alfalfa reduces your risk of calling me at two in the morning, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love perennial peanut hay, too. We're like very lucky in Florida to have access to that. So don't be afraid. If that's what the only thing they have at the feed store right now, like buy it all up. Perennial peanut. I mean, the only thing with that is it can be higher in calories. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you've got questions about any of this, uh, you can always reach Dr. Vineyard. Well, not always Dr. Vineyard, but you'll get a nutritionist from Purina. If you look on the back of the bag, there's a 1-800 number, and that will link you directly to one of their nutrition um, folks that can answer any question you have about feeding a horse. Uh, if you've got questions and you're a regular client of ours, give us a call, and we will absolutely be there to help you try and formulate and bring in Dr. Vineyard if we, we need to go to that next level. So... Uh, I just want to, again, say thank you, Dr. Vineyard. It's it's tough out there right now. I know it is. And we just want to make sure that everyone had some strategies for, for how to get through this. All right. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Okay. Uh, 